Hey guys, it's the Lord Owls here, and today I want to give you guys uh, four book recommendations for you if you really like The Horned Altar by Tess Dawson, or because I've noticed that this book review gets a steady stream of views, maybe not a lot, but there's certainly a lot of interaction because I get a lot of comments and questions and things like that. And I figure, you know, that area of ancient Mesopotamia, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, um, the Akkadians, the Canaanites, all those people all lived in the Fertile Crescent. Different time periods, right? Time periods are very important uh, to understand whenever you're um, talking about uh, ancient Mesopotamia. So I really, really like this book here. It's a book of myths and legends from Mesopotamia. I like how it says from Mesopotamia. Uh, you'll see some of my other books, they'll be like, oh, Canaanites or oh Chaldeans or oh Babylonians Akkadians whatever whereas this is just like they all come from the same mother culture we talk about this in uh, my anthropology classes especially talking about Mesoamerica right a lot of Mesoamerican um the cultures they share the same mother culture there right so like the Aztecs were probably the most different because they moved in from elsewhere they they marched down from the north right but Oaxaca all those other places uh, Teotihuacan all those little places they all have the same mother culture right so it's kind of like that in the Fertile Crescent as well in fact if you really want to get into it there is a fertile valley in Mesoamerica and the way that they kind of built up is a very similar to the way the Fertile Crescent built up. So if you're really interested in how societies and civilizations form, you might want to research this and then turn around and research Mesoamerica because it's fascinating the parallels you find. Anyway, um, to get back to the subject, this has a timeline in it. Um, so that you can actually refer to it when you're reading. There's a chronological chart. I'm going to show you guys this chart because I think it is just fantastic to let you know kind of what's going on, right? Um, kind of lets you know because, you know, it's like there's different kingdoms, right? Like whenever you're studying um, ancient Egypt, there's different kingdoms. It's like that in ancient Mesopotamia too. So <clears throat> the other thing that I love the most about this is that it has both versions of a lot of the stories, right? So it has the Epic of Gilgamesh in here, right? So it's got the standard version and then it has the old Babylonian version because a lot of times these stories, they're written on clay tablets and translated, you'll find the same story at two different sites and the stories vary a little bit. Sometimes they vary a lot. Sometimes they only vary a little bit. Um, so there's a couple of other things like the stories of Nergal and Ereshkigal. There's a standard version and then an Amarna version, right? Because tablets found in Amarna were different. Uh, the story of Anzu also has a standard version and an old Babylonian version, right? So, and this is just very, very well written, right? And it's, the way that it's uh, pieced together is a little bit easier to understand and follow. The next one, this is also a book on mythology. We're going to get into other magic books in a minute because I've got two other magic books and then two mythology books. This one is fantastic. Anything by Leonard William King is going to be great. Leonard William King lived from 1869 to 1919. So this is like, you know, OG anthropology, if you will. Uh, so there are some things in here that aren't always accurate. But what I like about this guy is even though it's from 1919, he'll tell you like, you know, this is what we believe is going on, but we don't have all the pieces to the puzzle. And for him to admit that in 1919 and for me to read it now and be like, yeah, no, you didn't, did you? Um, is kind of nice. It's, it's kind of nice. It's very humble, very humble person. Um, 
But yeah, his work I love so much simply because of the way that he writes. It's very accessible for something that was written in 1919. Um, I'll just read a sentence here. Although little by little a higher idea of the majesty of certain gods was developed, and although the Babylonians' conception of a man's duty towards them and towards his neighbor eventually became of a comparatively high moral character, he never succeeded in freeing himself from a belief in the power of magic, sorcery, and witchcraft. I like that. Uh, I like the way that that is written. It gives me an idea of how this person um, feels about magic and witchcraft, right? Um, but at the same time, this guy is very, very good um, at uh, what he knows. And the way that he talks about it, let's see, it is probable, uh, he's talking about how, okay, who occupied the country before the Sumerians came, we cannot say, for the aboriginal inhabitants of the land, we know nothing. He's talking about that area of Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent. The first inhabitants of Babylonia, of whom we have definite knowledge, are the Sumerians, and during recent years, our knowledge of them has been vastly increased. In any treatment of religious beliefs of the Semitic Babylonians, the existence of the Sumerians cannot be ignored, for they profoundly influenced the faith of the Semitic invaders before whose onslaught their empire fell. The religious beliefs of the Babylonians cannot be rightly understood unless at the outset this foreign influence is duly recognized. Gives credit where credit's due. I like the way his book is organized. Um, it's got six chapters, which are fairly easy for me to read off for you. The Gods of Babylon, Heaven, Earth, and Hell, The Legends of Creation, uh, Chapter 4, The Story of the Deluge, Chapter 5, Tales of Gods and Heroes, Chapter 6, The Duty of Man to His God and to His Neighbor. <clears throat> These next two actually deal with their magical heritage and sorcery, right? Uh, this one is also by Leonard William King, and it's simply called Babylonian Magic and Sorcery. Um, the Prayers of the Lifting of the Hand. And what this is, is that it'll tell you right here too, this book is just a translation of the cuneiform text of a group of Babylonian and Assyrian incantations and magical formula edited with transliterations, translations, and full vocabulary from tablets of the Kuyunjik collections preserved in the British Museum. So you'll see that even in the back, there's a list of tablets in the back. There's also in the appendices, uh, you have lists, you have all kinds of lists, um, portions of words and ideographs of uncertain reading. So things that he knows that he may not have translated all the way correctly because there were portions missing, boom, there's more information there in Appendix 3. Um, and then there's the indexes, index to tablets and duplicates, and index to registration numbers. So if you wanted to look at those tablets yourself, if you wanted to either visit the British Museum or if that's where they're still housed today, um, if you want to visit them or if you want to Google them, you can find all of that information in the indexes so that you can cross-reference his translations with your own if you are also a scholar. I love books like that. Um, anyway, this is actually a pretty good little book of translations. And again, he divvies them up into very interesting categories that I feel like a modern scholar wouldn't have broken them up into these categories. They would have made it more complicated. And he broke them up into uh, much more simple categories. So the first section is prayers to groups of deities, right? So you're not just calling on one deity, you're calling on a group of them. Section two is going to be prayers addressed to specific gods. And you'll know which gods they are because it's in the title of each prayer. Uh, section three is prayers addressed to goddesses. Again, the exact goddess's name will be in the title. 
uh, prayers to deities whose names are not preserved. And there's one. <laughs> There's one prayer there. They have their own section devoted to the tablet who they don't know who they're praying to. Um, prayers to astral deities. So um, to get you an idea of what it is, uh, prayers to the star Mulmil, prayer to the star Coxidi, and then there is a Sibziana. I don't know if that's a star or constellation or whatnot. I haven't made it that far into this book. These are recommendations, not reviews. So I haven't read all of these. These are some big old honking books. Uh, and then the last section is prayers against the evils attending an eclipse of the moon. So just from that chapter title, we know that the Babylonians were very concerned with lunar eclipses unleashing evil. Cute, huh? Pretty cool. And then the last one we have here is Chaldean magic. Um, by Francois Lenormand, Lenormand, and this one, this one is a pretty big honking book too. He covers a lot of ground because there's a part one and a part two of this. And this guy lived from 1837 to 1883. So around the same time period as Leonard, uh, William King did. So this is a bit older, but I love, I love this one. This one is fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Because this guy was an anthropologist, kind of. They weren't really calling themselves that right now uh, at this point in history. But uh, he was definitely obsessed with magic, absolutely obsessed with magic. And that totally comes out here. And I'm going to show you guys the different chapters so that you can pause the book and read them off yourself. Pause the book. So you can pause the video and read them off yourself because he covers he covers a lot of stuff and I'm sorry my my Fred baby my 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 cat is going crazy right now so yep okay cool so if you pause those and read all of those you'll definitely see um the first parts the first few chapters are all about the Chaldeans, right? And we all know the Chaldeans, we're still talking about the same mother culture when we're talking about the Chaldeans and the Canaanites and the Babylonians and all that, the Sumerians, all the stuff. We're still talking about generally the same mother culture here. So everything you read in this book can totally be applied to your Canaanite practice and Babylonian and Sumerian practices, right? Um, anyway. He talks about, I like how he does a comparison of Egyptian and Chaldean magic. And then he has a chapter where uh, he compares Indian and Chaldean magic systems. Um, uh, differences between Akkadian and Egyptian magic, uh, Chaldeo-Babylonian religion and doctrines, developments of Chaldean mythology. And of course, that's going to be, you can kind of tell from the chapter heading what's going to be mostly uh, theoretical and what's going to be mostly factual. So a chapter like that, the development of the Chaldean mythology, you can tell that's going to be theoretical. It's going to be his idea of how it, of how it formed. So you can tell all that from the chapter headings. He does, um, because he's a linguist and everything, he does come forth with a theory that, um, because we know that the Akkadian people in their language, when they came down from the north, again, a lot like the Aztecs, but anyway, uh, we're not going to go into those comparisons anymore. <laughs> they came from somewhere farther north, and the Akkadian language is very different from the Sumerian, Babylonian, and all those languages are, right? There's actually a linguistic... Um, How do I say it? There's like a linguistic connection between Akkadian and Finnish. That's right, Finland, Finnish, right? And so he takes a lot of time, several chapters, um, discussing that connection. And these are theoretical. I think they're still theoretical to this day. I don't think linguists have actually come out and said, oh yeah, the Akkadians came from the same mother language as the Finnish people and they lived here. We don't have all of that information yet, so I think it might still be theoretical. Um, yeah, and it definitely talks about how 
the Akkadian and the Sumerian cultures butted heads a little bit. Um, in that chapter, chapter 25, the two ethnic elements in the Babylonian nation. Yeah. It's very cool. This is a very good book. It, it co again, this covers a lot. It's a very, very good book. So I hope that you guys like these recommendations. And if you're at all interested in Sumerians, Babylonians, or if you just really like The Horned Altar by Tess Dawson, you'll probably really like these books. Um, maybe not get all four of them right away. Um, but definitely get some of the mythology books because the mythology books that are out there, um, they're going to really bridge the gap. You really want to understand a culture's mythology before you start to try to understand their magic because it's just their worldview is tied into their mythology. Their magical beliefs are tied into their mythology, right? So in order to get just a very good intuitive idea of, of how they view the world and how they view how magic works, mythology is the key to unlocking all of that right? So I hope that you guys like these book recommendations. I will be listing them in the um, description box below. And uh, if I can link them to an Amazon link, I will. I bought most of these books either from Half Price Books or from the Magic Cauldron here in Houston because I like to support my local bookseller. So if you have a local occult bookshop, maybe pop in and see if they have anything. If you have a book on ancient Mesopotamian magic or mythology that you really like and you would like to recommend that to others as well, please feel free to put that in the comment section down below. And if you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel for more uh, book recommendations, book reviews, tarot unboxings, tarot reviews, and all the crazy stuff I do, the crafting stuff as well. And until next time, happy dabbling and bye-bye.